Thank you, Mark Nowitzki. Thank you, Jeff Cavins. And hello, Twin Cities. Good to. Uh, I, I want you to know that I got ready for this event earlier this week by watching the last half of Little Major League while I was on the treadmill at 6.30 in the morning. We all know, or should know, what Adam said to Eve on the way out of the Garden of Eden. Remember that? Adam said to Eve, we live, my dear, in a time of transition. <laughs> I think we've all had a sense this past year of living in a profound time of transition in the history of the church, the end of one pontificate, the beginning of another, a papal transition unprecedented in the history of the world's oldest institutional office. If we want to grasp, however, the great possibility of this transitional moment, we have to understand just what it is and just where it fits in the 2,000-year flow of Christian history. And so I'd like to begin my remarks this afternoon with a very brief, but I hope interesting, history lesson. I'd like us to wind our mind's eye back to the late 19th century, to be precise, to 1878. In that year, the longest serving Pope in reliably recorded history, Pope Pius IX, died after a pontificate of 32 years. He had been elected in 1846, 14 years, 15 years before the beginning of the American Civil War. And the cardinals of the church in 1878, evidently thinking that a, an older Pope could keep the chair warm for a few years, elected a man who by the standards of 1878 was an old man. He was all of 68 years old. That sounds younger to me all the time. But by the standards of 1878, that was old. His name was Gioacchino Vincenzo Pecci. He took the papal name Leo XIII, and confounding the expectations of the cardinals who elected him, he proceeded to have the second longest pontificate in reliably recorded history until John Paul II topped him at the end of his papacy. Leo XIII is the man who set in motion all that we have experienced in the Catholic Church in our lifetimes. Unlike Pius IX, who had taken a rather dramatically hostile view towards modern culture, society, politics, Leo XIII made the dramatic strategic decision that the Catholic Church would engage the modern world with distinctively Catholic tools. You get a sense of Leo's grand strategy if you go and visit his tomb in Rome, which is not in St. Peter's Basilica. He's the last pope not to have been buried in St. Peter's. Uh, he's buried in the Pope's Cathedral, St. John Lateran in Rome. And he's buried just to the left of the apse of that great basilica. And unlike other funerary monuments where the deceased saint, priest, bishop, pope 
is portrayed in stone lying on their back on top of a casket with their hands piously folded on their chest in expectation of a glorious resurrection. Leo XIII is portrayed standing up with his right foot thrust forward and his right hand raised, wearing that papal tiara, as if to say to the modern world, we have something to talk about. We have a proposal to make. We are here to engage you. And over the course of his 25-year pontificate, which ended in 1903, Leo XIII set in motion every one of the dynamics in Catholic life that we have been living with and through and riding on the, the surface of, like surfers on a wave, uh, for the past 60, 70, 80 years. Before I describe that, I should also say Leo XIII was a man with a puckish sense of humor. When he was 90 years old, uh, he received an audience, an American bishop, who at the end of their half-hour conversation got a bit misty-eyed and said to Leo, Holy Father, I expect this is the last time we'll see each other on this earth. And the 90-year-old pope reached over and patted the bishop on the arm and said, my dear man, you didn't tell me you were feeling poorly. <laughs> Leo XIII was a great papal reformer. He launched the renewal of Catholic intellectual life in the late 19th century by mandating the close study of St. Thomas Aquinas as a particularly apt means for the Catholic Church to engage modern intellectual life. He authorized and initiated the modern Catholic study of the Bible. He opened the Vatican archives to qualified sco historical scholars of any faith or no faith on the understanding that the church has to learn from history. And he began what we know as Catholic social doctrine, that distinctive Catholic reflection on modern political and economic life that begins with Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum. All of these Leonine initiatives set in motion the great Catholic Renaissance of the mid-20th century, particularly in Europe, a Renaissance of philosophy and theology, a Renaissance in the study of the Bible, in the study of church history, in thinking through the church's relationship to human rights, religious freedom, uh, new forms of political life like democracy. And that mid-20th century Catholic Renaissance in turn set the floor, built the floor, if you will, that supported the work of the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965. Vatican II did not just happen. Vatican II was prepared by this 80 years of Catholic Renaissance and reform initiated by Leo XIII. Vatican II left the church 16 documents, all of which are well worth reading today. But unlike every other ecumenical council, the previous 20 ecumenical councils in, in church history, Vatican II left behind no keys to interpret those documents. Unlike the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, it did not write a creed like the creed we recite at Mass on Sundays. Unlike the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon in the early 5th century, Vatican II made no dogmatic definitions, such as the definition of Our Lady as Theotokos, Mother of God. Unlike many councils throughout the history of the Church, Vatican II condemned no heresies, 
uh, anathematized no heretics. Unlike the Council of Trent, it didn't authorize a catechism. It left us 16 documents, but it did not leave us a way to weave those documents into a coherent tapestry, into a coherent whole. And that is one of the reasons why we had 20 years of turmoil following Vatican II as the church tried to understand how to put the puzzle of Vatican II back together, how to weave those different patches, those documents into a single beautiful tapestry. Then God raised up two men of Vatican II, one a Pole, the other a Bavarian, one the Archbishop of Krakow during the council, the other a prominent conciliar theologian, the first named Karol Wojtyla, the second named Joseph Ratzinger, and in their papacies, which spanned some 35 years, John Paul II and Benedict XVI provided the church with the keys to unlocking the full treasures of the Second Vatican Council. And a critical moment in that process came in 1985, when John Paul II summoned a special meeting of the World Synod of Bishops to discuss in Rome for a full month what had gone right and what had gone not so right in the implementation of Vatican II over the previous 20 years. And under the intellectual leadership of then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, that special synod of 1985 gave us the key to the proper understanding of Vatican II, gave us the thread, if you will, that tied together those pieces of cloth into a beautiful Catholic tapestry. And that key or that thread was the idea that the church is a communion of disciples in mission. All three words being critically important. Disciple. The church is formed by men and women who have entered into friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ and whose lives have been transformed radically by that friendship. And one of the ways those disciples' lives are transformed is that they become members of a communion that Pope Pius XII called the mystical body of Christ. The disciples are the members of the body of Christ in the world, and that forms them into a, a human association that is different than any other. It's not quite like a family. It's not like a business or a trade union. It's not a political party. It's not a government. It's not a voluntary organization, although it has elements of all of those forms of human association in it. Rather, the fathers of the 1985 Synod said it's a communion. It's a communion in which our relationship to each other is unlike any other relationship in our lives. Because in no other relationship in our lives are we forming, if you will, the cells, the tissue of the mystical body of Christ. But that communion of disciples does not exist for its own sake. It exists for the sake of mission. It exists to offer others the possibility of friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ, incorporation into the communion that is his mystical body. John Paul II picked up this theme six years later in 1991 in his encyclical on Christian mission, Redemptoris Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, in which the Pope taught 
that the church does not have a mission, as if mission were one of 10 things the church does, the church is a mission. Everything and everyone in the church is measured by mission effectiveness. A year later, in 1992, John Paul II began to use the phrase, the new evangelization, as a way to sum up this idea of a church that is a mission. And then, in the great jubilee of 2000, he did something quite remarkable that very much touches our theme today and the theme of this great program in the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in recent months, Rediscover. What did he do? He went to the Holy Land. You remember that in, in March 2000. Why, why did he go? In the retrospect of 13 years, it seems ever more clear to me what was going on there. John Paul II did not go to the Holy Land simply to satisfy a desire of his own pilgrim's heart although that was surely part of his intention. He didn't go to the Holy Land simply to draw the world's attention to an anniversary, although that was surely part of his intention as well. No, it now seems ever more clear to me that what John Paul II did for a week in March 2000 was put the entire Catholic Church, in a sense, put the entire Catholic Church on his back and carried it with him to the places of salvation history so that we could touch again and see again and smell again and taste again something terribly important for the future. Namely, that Christianity is not just a story. Christianity is not a myth. Christianity is not one spirituality in a supermarket of spiritualities. Christianity, Christians believe, is the truth of the world. And the truth of the world is that God, in the person of his Son, entered human history at a time we can know and in places we can touch. And because of that, men and women, not all that different from us, became friends of Jesus of Nazareth. And in meeting him on Easter and after Easter as the risen Lord, they were so radically transformed that they went out and transformed the world. I've often asked friends who are going to Rome for the first time to stand in the square, to stand in St. Peter's Square, and to look at that magnificent basilica, one of the great architectural, artistic, engineering feats of of humanity and ask yourself how did a probably illiterate fisherman from east of nowhere come to this city and get the world's greatest tombstone? Because that's what St. Peter's is. It's the world's greatest tombstone. And he's right there under the altar. And you can go on a tour of the so-called Scavi and you can get as close to the bones of St. Peter as I am to that screen. How did that happen? It happened because he became a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was so utterly transformed by that that he could go to the center of world power 
to tell the world the story of God's passionate love for the world he had created and the world he had now redeemed. John Paul II, in going to the Holy Land, wanted all of us to, if you will, rub our noses in that stuff of redemption, to touch again the reality of Christian faith, to understand that this is not just a beautiful way to imagine history, to ponder what happens when men and women meet the risen Lord and enter into friendship with him. What happens is that they become missionaries. They become evangelists. What happens is we, like they, 2,000 years ago, can hear that risen Lord bid an earthly farewell to his friends by giving them the Great Commission. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That Great Commission was not simply given to a ragtag gang of fishermen, zealots, a teenager, tax IRS agent of the time, tax collector. It's given to each one of us. When each of us was baptized through the grace of the Holy Spirit, we were given the Great Commission. And to drive this point home even more deeply, at the end of the Great Jubilee of 2000, on January 6, 2001, the conclusion of the Jubilee year, John Paul II issued the apostolic letter entering the new millennium, Novo Millennio in Aunte, in which he took as his central image for all of us, the fifth chapter of Luke's Gospel. Disciples have been out on the Sea of Galilee all night, haven't caught anything. The Lord appears on the shore, says, what have you caught? They said, nada, nothing. He said, put out into the deep. Put out into the deep for a catch. And Blessed John Paul II was saying to us in invoking that biblical image that the Lord is saying that to the whole church as it begins the third millennium of its life. The Lord is telling us, calling us, to leave the shallow waters of institutional maintenance and to put out into the deep for a catch. The deep of what? The deep of a storm-tossed, windy, often violent, late modern world, in order to catch what? In order to catch men and women by inviting them into friendship with Jesus Christ. This summons to the church to rediscover the missionary imperative at the heart of Christian faith is, I believe, the culmination of the transition in the Catholic Church that began in 1878 with the election of Pope Leo XIII. This past century and a quarter has been drawing to a close a phase of Catholic history that I call in the book Evangelical Catholicism uh, the phase of counter-reformation Catholicism, the church in which many of us in this room grew up, even as the door is opening to a new phase of the church's history, the church of the new evangelization, or as I style it, evangelical Catholicism. And this transition has come just in time this rediscovery of the missionary imperative has come in the nick of time. Why? 
because the circumstances in which we must carry on the faith, transmit the faith to future generations, have changed dramatically since the Second World War. As late as the late 1950s, the early 1960s, perhaps this was true here in the Twin Cities, I know it was true in Baltimore where I grew up, a very Catholic city, the surrounding culture helped our parents and grandparents and our priests and sisters transmit the faith to us. The faith was in the air. It was part of the air you breathed. Well, that air is quite different now. The surrounding cultural air has become, unfortunately, toxic to the point of being poisonous. Not only does the culture not transmit the faith any longer, the culture is in many respects hostile to the faith. No Catholic of any age from teenage up, no matter how well catechized, can walk through any shopping mall in America today and not have their Christian sensibility assaulted visually and in other ways simply by walking through the mall. It's a very different world out there, and it's not a world that's conducive to the transmission of the gospel. We can't pass the faith along anymore by osmosis or by ethnic identity. We can't be Catholic simply because our grandfather was born in County Cork or in Palermo or, in my case, in the south of Germany. The faith has to be actively proposed and the faith must be borne witness to by the quality of our lives if the faith is going to be transmitted to others. Pope Francis recently took up this theme when he described the church, I think Bishop Flores mentioned this this morning, as a field hospital after a battle. I'm not sure the battle's over, but in any event, what's the battlefield? The battlefield is late modern culture. There are a lot of walking wounded out there. And the church has to find ways to offer those walking wounded the divine mercy, which was so important an image to John Paul II, to offer friendship with Jesus Christ, whom John Paul used to describe as the answer to the question that is every human life. The church has to find a way to be a missionary church again. And by mission, I don't mean simply going to exotic parts of the world that have never heard the gospel. I mean going into our families, our neighborhoods, our business and professional lives, our culture, our politics, every facet of the human condition is to be touched by the grace of God in Christ. Some 10 or 15 years ago, I was driving between Dallas and Fort Worth, and I noticed along the freeway this enormous Pentecostal megachurch. Everything's big in Texas, but this was really big. Maybe 10,000 people on a Sunday. Huge, huge parking lot. And I noticed that it all of the exits from the parking lot, you had to drive past a sign. Looked like a road sign, you know, right turn only, left turn only, whatever. If it's Texas, it was almost certainly right turn only, but anyway. <coughs> so I went to see what the sign said. And every one of those, maybe 10,000 people, leaving that megachurch every Sunday, drove past a sign that said simply, you are entering mission territory. 
you are entering mission territory. That's a sign we should have in our minds. Because each of us, by reason of our baptism and by reason of this challenging, in some ways, hostile culture in which we find ourselves, each of us enters mission territory every day. We enter it in our families, as I say, our neighborhoods, our business and professional lives, our lives as citizens, our lives as consumers. All of that is mission territory. And we are summoned to be missionaries. And that means that the Catholicism of the 21st century and beyond is going to be a much more demanding Catholicism than that with which many of us grew up. Because to be those witnesses, to be those missionaries, to be those evangelists, we are going to have to have deepened our friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ to a more intensified encounter with him in both word and sacrament. The Catholicism of the future is one in which all of us will, as a regular part of the rhythms of our lives, spend 10 to 15 minutes a day with the Word of God and the Bible. It's a Catholicism in which we are nurtured regularly by the Holy Eucharist and by the Sacrament of Reconciliation, when we can bring all the difficulties of the new evangelization and all of our failures to be the witnesses we should be before the divine mercy present in the confessional in the person of Christ's priest. We're all going to have to take our baptism much more seriously. Americans remember birthdays. Some Catholics in the United States remember their saint's day. Married couples remember their wedding anniversary. But I've been asking Catholic audiences around the country for the past six months since Evangelical Catholicism was published, how many of you know the date of your baptism? And about 1% of the crowd raises its hand. I'll tell you how that question occurred to me. It, first occurred to me 25 years ago when in the course of my life in Washington I began working with evangelical Protestants on pro-life matters, religious freedom issues, the support of the persecuted church around the world. And I discovered that in some parts of the evangelical Protestant world they have a very interesting way of introducing themselves at meetings. You know, the normal American business is you go around the table and, you know, I'm John Jones and I work at such and such. And I'm Jane Smith and I have three children and two grandchildren and I work in the local library or whatever. Well, these guys didn't do that. It would be, I'm John Jones and I was born again on such and such a day. Or I'm Jane Smith and I was born again on such and such a day. They would come around to me and cantankerous soul that I can be, I would say, I'm George Weigel, and I was born again on April 29th, 1951, at which point I was precisely 12 days old. Get an interesting question, uh, get an interesting, interesting discussion going about sacramental regeneration. But here's something, let me suggest very concretely, in order to begin to put on this identity of evangelical Catholicism, this Catholicism of the new evangelization to each of you. When you go home this evening, go to your file cabinet and find where you keep your Catholic record stuff and look up the date of your baptism. And for the rest of your life, make that a special day in your life, because that's the day that each of us was commissioned as a missionary. In order to be these missionaries, we need, as I say, an intensified encounter with the Lord through his word and in his sacraments. 
we also have to understand that Catholicism is a lifetime learning experience. That's why you're here today, because you want to deepen your knowledge of the faith and your experience of the faith. Let me suggest that as 15 minutes with the Bible a day is essential to nourishing a sense of oneself as a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ and his missionary in the world, and as a regular reception of the Holy Eucharist and the Sacrament of Reconciliation deepens that friendship, 20 minutes or a half an hour a week with either the Catechism of the Catholic Church or the New Youth Catechism, the UCAT, is a good way to deepen our understanding of what John Paul II used to call the symphony of Catholic truth. It's a symphony. There are different instruments in it. Not all of us learn to play all the instruments, and none of us learn to play all the instruments at the same time. We have to learn this over a lifetime. But in learning about that full symphony of Catholic truth, we're not only deepening our friendship with the Lord, we're deepening our capacity to be his missionaries in the world and to be his witnesses in the world. Because it increasingly seems to me that our situation is not unlike that of early Christianity. We're marking this year the 1700th anniversary of the full legalization of Christianity in the Roman Empire by Constantine, 313 AD. That anniversary poses a question. How did that happen? How did Christians come to be what scholars now tell us is perhaps one half of the population of the Roman Empire by the time of Constantine's Edict of Toleration. How did this small band of people from the far, far fringes of what the world understood to be power and influence, how did they convert half of that world in a little less than three centuries? The answer that many historians suggest today is very interesting. They suggest it was primarily by witness that Christianity converted the Roman Empire, not by argument, although argument is important, but primarily by witness. Think of the world of the movie Gladiator. That's not 500 BC, that's the middle of the second century AD and it's still a very brutal, violent world where no one is safe. And in that world, the witness of Christians who were prepared to suffer and die for their faith, who took care of the ill, who lived a noble egalitarianism in which there was neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, because all were one in Christ, those Christians for whom women were not property to be disposed of, but fully equal human beings, in which unwanted children were not exposed on mountainsides, those Christians made a powerful witness. <coughs> Excuse me. And their witness was so powerful that people were compelled to say, how can you live that way? How can you live like that? How can you live nobility and compassion and fellow feeling in this cold and hard and cruel world? And then the answer comes. I can live that way because of the grace of my friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me suggest to you, friends, that that's our situation today too. We are on a battlefield and there are lots of walking wounded at the end of the day. And if we in our Catholic lives can model a more noble, compassionate, caring, 
humane way of life. And in what is an increasingly cold and cruel postmodern world, people will come to us and say, how can you live that way? And we can say, I can live that way because of the grace of friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I've often said that the greatest line ever written about John Paul II was not, unfortunately, written by me. I wrote about 1,700 pages of two books on John Paul II. But the greatest line was not written by me. It was written at the very beginning of the pontificate by a French journalist, a man named André Frossard, who had grown up in the fashionable atheism of post-war Paris, who had come to Christ in the church late in life, and who was in Rome covering the election of this hitherto unknown Polish bishop as the Bishop of Rome. And when he heard that homily on October 22nd, 1978, be not afraid, open the doors to Christ. Be not afraid, open the doors to Christ. And when he saw John Paul II take that pastoral staff, that cross he carried all the time, and wave it like a great sword of faith, blessing the crowd. Andre Frassard wrote back to his Paris newspaper a story that began with this remarkable line. This is not a pope from Poland. This is a pope from Galilee. This is not a pope from Poland. This is a pope from Galilee. That's where we're being summoned. We're all being summoned to Galilee to meet the risen Lord, to deepen our friendship with him, to hear his great commission, and then to take that commission and go out and convert the world, healing a broken culture at the same time. I thank you for all that all of you are already doing in that great task, and I invite each of you to be ever more the evangelical missionary that you were baptized to be. Thank you very much.